Great. Awesome. Can can people hear me? Thumbs up if that's true. OK, great. Awesome. Perfect. And hello, I'm Nora. Um, there is a group of people here. So if I turn my face this way, it's because I'm actually talking to real human beings that um, are in the lab. So exciting. Uh, I'm happy that people decided to come um, amidst a COVID crisis. Uh, but here we are. Um, thank you. So I am going to start my talk um, first to give a little bit of a outline. I'll give a brief introduction about me, um, a little bit about what public health and epidemiology are, a little bit about causality, because that's one of the cool things. Um, I'll go into the People's CDC, which is a resource unrelated to the CDC, sort of related to the CDC, but not officially related to the CDC, I will say, is the, you know, we'll get into it more in my talk. Um, social epidemiology is my specialty. That's what I'm studying at the University of Maryland. So I'm going to talk a little bit about social epidemiology and uh, the intersections of social justice and some other things that I really like about it. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the work that I do in gun violence prevention and then um, any questions you guys have. Um, so cool. All right. So about me. Hello. I am a trans non-binary queer public health scientist. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I'm a PhD student studying social epidemiology at the University of Maryland. Um, I currently have four degrees, which is a bit much, um, and I'm working on my fifth. So I'm either like really smart or really silly or like maybe a little bit in between. I started doing stand-up comedy, so you might think I might be a little silly. Um, so some of my specialties are, you know, firearm violence and violence prevention, LGBTQIA populations, disability, social justice, social theory, uh, mental health and trauma. I'm still a lot of fun at parties, um, but those are the things that I like to study for my day job. Uh, so why am I excited to talk to you about public health and epidemiology? Um, so Public health and epidemiology, a lot of people consider to be the backbone of public health or, or the, the science, the basic science of public health is sort of what epidemiology is. And so I asked one of the people in the car ride over what they sort of thought epidemiology was because it's always a lot of the study of the, you know, movement of disease or, you know, and that's that's not wrong. That is definitely something that epidemiology <coughs> does and was originally um, you know, one of the founding ideas of epidemiology was in infectious disease. It has grown to incorporate a lot more since then. Um, but I like talking about epidemiology because a lot of people don't understand the population health perspective of the epidemiology. A lot of people think about the spread of disease as the virus, you know, goes from one person coughing into their mouth and then then that person gets the virus and that virus enters their cells. And a lot of it is molecular biology and a lot of it is individual level thinking of transference, which isn't wrong either. That's also part of epidemiology. But again, epidemiology is a lot more than just the transference of biological species. Um, so this is the 10 essential public health services of the CDC. This is sort of to give you an idea that Epidemiology is a lot more than infectious disease, but epidemiology is just one facet of public health, which is far more than what epidemiology is when epidemiology is already so much. So what is public health? Um, public health is the CDC developed this model, updated it in 2020 to incorporate equity in the center, which I think is like the biggest sort of update to this model is the incorporation of equity. Um, with all parts of it. You have assessment, policy development, and assurance. Um, epidemiologists can be a part of every single one of those wheels of color. They can function in every single one. Uh, sometimes they do more of the quality evaluation or implementation science, but epidemiologists are trained in many of the essential public health services. A master's in public health really just makes you um, very well certified to basically tackle any part of public health. It's a whole master's that teaches you the 10 essential, like it teaches you basically 
it's a professional degree that gives you all of the tools that you need to do public health within any sphere. Um, so talking about certified in public health, the CPH exam is something that you can take after your master's, um, or it's something you can take after, like, I think a couple of years of working within public health. The point I'm trying to make with this is it's a comprehensive exam for public health professionals, right? But there's 10% of 10 different categories, which all represent things that public health professionals need to know. So that gives you an idea again of this is where epidemiology falls, evidence-based approaches to public health. That's 10%, but it's only 5% because the other 5% is biostatistics. So we're talking about one very small facet of public health is actually um, going to be epidemiology and so much more of public health is application, policy, making changes in the ways the numbers show up in the epidemiological studies. So, you know, just to give an idea, epidemiologists are trained in all aspects of public health, but we have specialties within quantitative methods. And that's sort of the things masters of public health people ought to know if they're going to go take their CPH exam. Um, so evolution of epidemiology, relatively new as a formal scientific di discipline. Um, the practice of conducting epidemiological studies is not new. Counting health and disease goes back centuries. Uh, many of design and analytical techniques that we use today arose in response to health concerns in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, this is a map of the Broad Street neighborhood. Um, John Snow, counted as the first epidemiologist, was an anesthesiologist during a particularly nasty cholera epidemic in London in 1854. Um, you can see, let me, let me put my little highlighter on. Um, so all of these counts around here show where different cholera cases were popping up in the neighborhood. And you see there's an especially large amount around these areas where the counts are very are higher. So just mapping the incidence of cholera, he was able to determine also while walking through these nasty neighborhoods that there's sewage everywhere um, and was able to determine that it was one of the pumps of water that people were getting drinking water from that was completely contaminated. And that was the first epidemiologist. So um, John Snow. So again, we'll go back to another definition of epidemiology, um, the science of understanding the distribution and determinants of health and disease, morbidity, injuries, disability, and mortality in populations so that we may intervene to prevent disease and promote health. Um, so I like this definition that talks about intervening to promote health, um, which is one of my favorite parts about being an epidemiologist is while I study a lot of sad things, the reason I study them is because I want to make them different. Um, so this is a great meme, or I don't know what else to call it, uh, except it's not really funny. It's humans are designed for story, not catastrophe. We know how to process narrative, not numbers. This is something that epidemiologists are particularly good at. We are supposed to take these numbers and to make people care about them. And so we make a narrative that makes people care. So what are public health and epidemiology? Uh, this is a pretty great little metaphor where we're talking about, you know, um, I'll read the metaphor. He says, sometimes it feels like this. I'm standing by the shore of a swiftly flowing river. I hear the cry of a drowning man, so I jump into the river put my arms around him, pull him to shore and ap apply artificial respiration. Just when he begins to breathe, um, there is another cry for help. So I jump in, uh, reach the river, reach the person, pull him out, apply artificial respiration. And just as he begins to breathe, there's another cry for help. And I'm too busy addressing all the cries for help and the people in the river that I cannot go upstream to see who is the one pushing them in. And so public health aims to find the person pushing them in and stopping them from pushing them in the river. So what is epidemiology? 
it's a great metaphor, right? But what is epidemiology? What does it mean to look upstream? It's a study of health and disease in populations with the aim of improving health in populations. This is a good common sense definition, um, but they're subtly hidden there. What is it meant by health and what is it meant by disease? Um, and what is a population? We usually, but not always think of health and disease in terms of individual experiences. And are populations just groups of individuals or do they have different characteristics than individuals? So who are epidemiologists? I think we have one in the crowd, at least one. Maybe, no, no, we have a CDC member in the crowd. So maybe there, there might be an epidemiologist in the, in the Zoom room, um, I'm unsure, but uh, epidemiologists are scientists who are usually paid by the same people who pay the police and architects, that is governments and corporations. Um, sometimes a community's interest in health may be at odds with the state or corporate interests. And this is sometimes at odds with what the epidemiologists wish to study. Historically, epidemiologists used to be doctors and MDs, but now they're likely to be trained exclusively as epidemiologists. And modern epidemiology is currently practiced globally. And ideologically, public health tends to span from liberal to socialist. Um, make that epidemiology. So there are many different types of epidemiologies where infectious disease was maybe the founding of where epidemiology started. Um, and with traditional medical doctors, um, where it's the study of pathological organisms, the cause, responses with them. Um, we also have now environmental epidemiology, the study of toxic and radiological substances in our land, air, water, and food. Um, so smog, air pollution, pesticides, and cancers are all examples of environmental epidemiology. Chronic disease epidemiology, how we can age with better or worse quality of life. Um, so heart disease, diet, diabetes, and diet cancer, legal recreational drug use, exercise and functionality in old age. These are all examples of chronic disease epidemiology studies. Genetic epidemiology is the epidemiology of genetic etiology of disease and genetic predisposition of disease. Genetic etiology stands for where does it actually come from, the original source. Um, and so examples would be monozygotic, dizygotic twin studies of schizophrenia, heritability studies, et cetera. And so social epidemiology, that's, that's my specialty um, of how health and disease are partitioned across social divides, race, ethnicity, age, gender, sexuality, and socioeconomic status, immigrant status, et cetera. Um, it's also the studies of effects of different public health interventions, how they change across those divides, with the aim of making a society more healthy. So life expectancy is lower in countries with wider gaps between rich and poor. Clean indoor air laws are somewhat associated with different changes of prevalence of smoking among US blacks and US whites. The curious issue rates of breast cancer among women of different race ethnicity in the US versus the rest of the world. Um, these are all examples of questions that social epidemiology might try to answer. So epidemiological subdisciplines also focus on other things like maternal and child health, reproduction health, um, violence prevention, domestic violence, police violence, violence and armed conflicts, exercise and fitness, nutrition and food security and other areas, all with the aim of improving health. So while public health is multidisciplinary, epidemiology is also an interdisciplinary science. You have quantitative methods, you have historical accounts of disease, social determinants of disease. You have population structures, location of disease outbreaks, models of disease, health promotion programs, evidence to establish causality and health policy. These are all very important facets of epidemiology and also public health. There might be some crossover. Um, so some basic questions are what causes disease? How does disease spread? What prevents disease? What works in controlling diseases? Um, so we have, you know, the historical uses of epidemiology um, for health status and service uses. And then we have disease etiology where we're looking at the origin of the disease. So historical community health and health services are all health status and service use. Risk assessment, identifying syndromes, completing the clinical picture and disease causality are all part of disease etiology, which is what epidemiology is good for. Um, so examples of questions that can be answered 
by epidemiological research, is organic food better for human health? Will I get lung cancer from smoking e-cigarettes? How can youth violence be prevented? Um, and so this is the one public health cartoon I found that I thought was actually pretty funny. Um, and I think everyone in this room knows the difference between causality and correlation. Um, but just to get it through, um, causality. So ice cream and violence are correlated, but does one cause the other? So this just sort of goes through null hypothesis. There is no correlation. And the alternative hypothesis is there is a correlation. Whoops. Well, as it turns out, there is a correlation, but it is not causal. Um, one of my pictures didn't show up in this. Um, that's OK. We know that ice cream sales and rape or violent crimes are correlated, but they're certainly not causal. Ice cream sales do not cause rape and rape does not cause ice cream sales. But what does is the weather changes. And so we do know that ice cream sales go up in the summer as well as violent crime. So that is far more likely the causal corollary factor that links those two things together. Um, so quick review, epidemiology study of health health and disease in populations with the aim of improving health in populations. Epidemiologists like to think upstream and are therefore concerned with prevention of disease and illness. Epidemiologists study the causes, the distributions, and the natural histories of health and disease, and they evaluate interventions. Um, so I was a COVID epidemiologist for the Oregon Health Authority uh, back during the Omicron wave in 2022, um, 2021 to 2022. And uh, that was a really that was a really cool experience. Um, I, in the midst of being a COVID epidemiologist, found this resource on top of the CDC's resources. Um, the People CDC is uh, so this is from their website. What is the People CDC? Um, the People CDC is a coalition of public health practitioners, scientists, healthcare workers, educators, and advocates, and people from all walks of life working to reduce the harmful impacts of COVID nineteen. Um, they provide guidance and policy recommendations to governments um, and the public on COVID-19. They disseminate evidence-based updates and they're grounded in equity, public health principles and latest scientific literature. Um, they work with community orgs, build collective power. Um, their website has a lot of really good resources on how to mitigate COVID spread within different types of settings. Uh, and they originally popped up when the CDC started changing the way they were mapping COVID transmissions to show that COVID transmissions were not as bad as they actually were. And that's why the people CDC arose because people were like, wait, why did you just change it when it was showing up like, you know, number of tests, like positive testing and like number of tests positive versus like, um, forget the exact change they did but like now they they have like wastewater and they also have testing but the thing is with testing is people don't test as much now even though we have testing available to a certain extent people don't test as much um yeah so this is the cdc's covid weather report um all areas of the country are very are, are now at high or very high levels of covid transmission um and so this is wastewater viral activity level this data is from the cdc um, so you can make these graphs using CDC websites. It's actually pretty cool. Um, I'll show you some stuff that I made using CDC websites in a little bit. So currently the second highest wastewater levels since BA1, the first Omicron wave in January 2022. So when I was working as a COVID epidemiologist, that's that's about where we're at right now. Um, and all of this information is also on the People CDC website. So if you're really interested in seeing their weather reports every week or um, every time they publish them, they're just a really good, honest resource of what's going on with COVID in the country right now. So I highly recommend them. CDC is good too. They have really good resources. Um, People CDC also has, you know, comparable, I would say. So moving on to social epidemiology and, you know, um, People CDC to a certain extent is a social epidemiology upcrop, upcrop of, um, uh, people who are interested in equity. So while epidemiology is a study of distribution and determinants of states of health and population, social epidemiology is a branch of epidemiology concerned with the way social structures, institutions, and relationships influence health. 
Um, what's really cool about social epidemiology is studying social structures. And so that's something you can't see. And so much of science is stuff you can't see. And what's cool is sometimes people will argue with you about structural oppression, but when you have epidemiology, you have science and evidence at a population level that says it exists. So that's cool. That's cool to me, that you can actually show that these, uh, these forces are in effect, that they affect the health of America. They affect the health of Black Americans, of Asian Pacific Islanders. Uh, we see different health effects among birthing outcomes from white women versus all other types of minorities. Um, this, is, this is social epidemiology. So, you know, this is a theory of disease. <laughs> Infectious disease dynamics um, is a theory of infectious disease. We have agent, environment, host, vector. And so this is the infectious disease theory, you know, not social epidemiology. But but what about this can social epidemiologists use? You know, what is what is useful in this theory and what is missing from this theory? What do we mean by environment? You know, what what is the environment? for the population that we're talking about? What are, what are, all, these, what are all these definitions when we're thinking about them? Um, the host is the, is the individual who's hosting the agent. The agent is the pathogen. The environment is where they capture the agent. The vector is sometimes um, either droplets of water <laughs> producing pathogens or mosquitoes passing on malaria or fomites inanimate objects carrying on bacterial or viral particles to contaminate other people. So that's a vector. Theory versus model. <clears throat> a theory refers to the underlying principles given a phenomenon. Model is a simplified depiction of a given phenomenon. So we're going back to some CDC stuff um, related to social epidemiology. This is the social ecological model of health. Uh, we have different levels of ways in which health can affect an individual. And so what this does is it sort of displays the different levels of which societal community, interpersonal relationships can affect the health of individuals. And I'll give I'll get a give a better example in this screen. Um, we have this is the mental health and well-being, a socio-ecological model as presented by the I believe this is the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. So this is a resource from one of their, um, I guess, based on the ecology and human development originally. Uh, but yeah, so this is one of their Department of Health models. Uh, so at individual, it, met, it gives some examples of what does it mean, you know, for a socio-ecological model for mental health and well-being. What is individual inputs that affect our health? What are those? So adaptability, stress response, coping skills. Okay. Interpersonal relationships, what are the levels of that? That would be like societal roles, gender roles, family and peers, um, different support networks that you have. Then you have organizations, communities, um, which are two different levels of communities. Um, or an arthropod. Oh, yeah. Arthropod. Um, and so we have policy and society as the last two of the socio-ecological model. And those are sort of considered the more um, population-based uh, effects. So they're different. Different policies affect populations of people is different than the ways individuals are affected by their relationships. Um, but all of these can be modeled and looked at. Okay. So this is Nancy Krieger's, one of the seminal social uh, epidemiologists. She's at Harvard, really smart. Um, I'm not going to go into her theory because it's too smart for me to explain to a group of people. <laughs> um, but I will say this is just uh, from a glossary of a paper that she published. Um, just some common, common words uh, that people ought to be aware of. Um, in social epi, if they're if they're interested in social epi, uh, so I think I have a lot of uh, different animations, or maybe I don't. Oh yeah, I do. They're all showing up now. Um, so those are all. These are all sort of like 
different vocab words that are cool. Um, I'm going to just end on, let's see, where is social justice? Is social justice in here? Social determinants of health, sexualism, and heterosexism. Let's see. Ah, okay. Social determinants. We'll go into social determinants of health, um, which is refers to both specific features of pathways by which societal conditions affect health and could potentially be altered by informed action. Um, but as determinants, societal processes and conditions are conceptualized as essential factors. Um, <clears throat> so meaning we can either envisualize social determinants as something that are malleable that can be changed or something as immalleable that cannot be changed or immutable that cannot be changed without big actions. So like policy level actions is how you in many cases can address root causes. Um, these are cool. The last one, let's see, social production of scientific knowledge. I'll talk about this one. Um, this is, refers to the ways in which social institutions and beliefs affect recruitment, training practices, and funding of scientists, thereby shaping what questions we as scientists do and do not ask, the studies we do and do not conduct, and the ways in which we do and analyze and interpret data. Um, consider their likely flaws and disseminate results. So a good example of the social production of scientific knowledge would be me as a scientist studying trans violence um, by firearm. I don't know who else would be studying this if it wasn't me because I'm interested as a trans person in firearm violence in trans people. Um, so that would be a social production of scientific knowledge. My university is supporting me in studying this. They support my identity. Um, it would be very different type of story if I was at a university that did not support me, that did not support this kind of research and did not support my identity. And that's in part that there are universities out there that exist like that, that would not do those things for me. Um, and they also exist in America. I'm in Maryland. It's like one of the most liberal states in the country. Um, and I'm very blessed to be here in many ways. And so the social production of scientific knowledge can really thrive where people can be themselves. And so that's, you know, what I hope for, you know, social epidemiology is that, you know, this reaches all the social epidemiologists and know that their voice is necessary and needed. Okay. So Social epidemiology and LGBTQIA populations. Uh, gonna talk a little bit about the 2023 US National Survey on Mental Health of LGBTQ Young People. This is this is epidemiology. This is this is epidemiology that the Trevor Project does. They've been doing it, I want to say, for five or six years now. Um, and they do an amazing job. This is this is an epidemiological study. It is a cross-sectional survey where they reach tens of thousands of LGBTQ youth that fill this out in America. Um, and this is just some key findings um, from that study uh, that are all very sad. And if I read them out loud, I would maybe be a little sad about it. So I'm not gonna read them out loud, um, but you can look up the study uh, if you are interested in viewing more. Um, this is ways to support LGBTQ young people, um, those who um, had access to affirming homeschools and events had spaces reported lower rates of attempting suicide compared to those who did not. Um, affirming gender identity among trans and non-binary young people is consistently associated with low rates of attempting suicide. And so moving on to the anti-LGBTQ policies, this is part of their survey, but this is also greater part of epidemiology, right? So these policies not only affect the mental health of these students, it's criminalizing them. Um, but, you know, a lot of the policymakers are pushing these forward in an effort to protect children. I don't know any drag queen that's, you know, mass shooted up of whatever school, but I'm pretty sure, you know, that's not the actual threat is drag queen readings. Um, so now I'm gonna sort of segue. Oh, a little bit into firearm violence, uh, which I do think is an actual threat for youth. Um, so this is Whiskers data. So this is, I got this, I got this today. I finished these slides today. Um, and so I picked up these numbers from 2021 
And so this is the latest data from the CDC. Whiskers is the, uh, this is the all top 10 causes of death. And so this is just the top five right here. COVID's number five. Um, so here we have unintentional injury. You click on that little box and it pops open all of this information for you, which is quite cool. Um, if you go down to the seventh leading cause of death for unintentional injury, you see, um, I will, that's a great question, Sophia. I will, I will get to that. Um, and so if you see there's what, 229 firearm deaths uh, from unintentional injury, we're going to go remember this number though, motor vehicle traffic accidents, the number one unintentional injury. That's just almost, almost 8,500. Um, so now we're back to the, the main page. Here we have the top five leading causes of death, homicide. You might guess firearm is the leading cause of death of homicide. We have 6,000 deaths. Suicide, we have 3,826 deaths by firearm. Leading cause of deaths um, for suicide is by firearm for children. These are youth one to 24. Um, so for unintentional injuries, 229 firearm deaths. For homicide, we have 6,638 firearm deaths. And for suicide, we have 3,826 firearm deaths, which is more than motor vehicle accidents um, due to firearm discharge. So firearms are more deadly. They're the most deadly form of homicide, the most deadly form of suicide, and they are more deadly than motor vehicle accidents in America for youth one to 24. Um, and so homicide is also the leading cause of death for pregnant women in the United States. Um, this data also found in the CDC published um, from some Harvard professors, Karen Steen, Conan, and uh, uh, Rebecca Long, social epidemiologists as well um, that study gun violence. Uh, and so, you know, we have we have a we have a firearm problem here. Um, so social epidemiology and gun violence, can the theory of infectious disease apply to gun violence? I'm just bringing this back up again, you know, because we're thinking about agent, host, environment, you know, the so agent is the gun, the environment is what, the host is the person who gets shot by the gun, or is the agent the other person and the vector is the gun? I don't know. Um, but is there is there is there some utility in these theories that we can use for other types of epidemiology that aren't infectious disease? And the answer is actually sort of yes. There's something called a social contagion, um, which we know exists because reporting standards exist for the ways we report on suicide and firearms now. We no longer announce the name of the mass shooter in uh, news reports. Um, there are ways in which we talk about suicide when reporting on it, where we don't talk about the methods. Um, there are many different ways to, there are many different guidelines on how to report on these things that are related to reduce social contagion of these events. Um, so there is some merit to some of these theories in helping explain how some of these things can spread. Um, so just to end on the happiest note, <laughs> The U.S. may have experienced the steepest year-over-year -year drop in homicide this 2023, actually. So while gun violence is pretty bleak in America, we've actually seen in the last year the, the steepest drop in homicide since the pandemic started. Um, you know, we have theories, you know, getting to causality is a little nitty-gritty with epidemiologists because we never want to say... We want to be absolutely sure. We're scientists, you know. You can't you can't say something's the cause unless you absolutely know it's the cause. Um, you know, I can't lie because then I would be wrong, and I can't be wrong, right? So, um, but yeah. So just to end on a sort of okay, interesting note. Gun violence is finally you know going down at least for this year. Interestingly enough, um, and it's not evenly distributed across the country. Um, and while gun violence has declined across all categories, it, has, it hasn't across one, which is police violence and homicide, um, where police violence has not declined. So there is that too. Um, and so these are just my little notes and now we're done. So yay, um, I will take any questions. Um, let's see. Okay.
and there was one question in the chat that I'll that I'll read out loud first. Um, Sophia, thank you for your question. How might an epidemiologist interpret a disease disorder that is idiopathic, for example, POTS or ME-CFS? What is, I know what POTS is, but I don't know what ME-CFS is. Does, what is... Uh, so like, obviously, obviously it's an acronym, but it's like myalgic encephalomyelitis, and then, which is also chronic fatigue syndrome. And they were talking about how like lots of long haul COVID patients. So like for my example, my aunt, um, it's, it's, she's experiencing it. But the issue is that it's like relatively common and like in terms of symptoms, it's not necessarily as definitive, but it's definitely being recognized that this is something that's affecting a lot of people, particularly for long haul COVID patients. And so how about an epidemiologist approach that from both like, you know, more logistical side of like, okay, what are some diagnostic tests versus also the societal side where a lot of these doctors aren't really recognizing it as, you know, something because it just might it's really hard, you know, it's hard to figure this out if it's not something like concrete, like this is definitely, you know, it's hard to say that right now. So how would an epidemiologist, uh, especially a social epidemiologist approach that? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for uh, expanding that a little bit. Um, so I think, uh, you know, one, you would want to think about this in terms of like a disability framework, right? Because now we're talking about chronic disease um, and how that affects people um, long term. So you'd probably want to use some sort of chronic, chronic disease framework where you're, you know, capturing, the, you want to capture these people earlier on. Um, and so why aren't doctors listening to their patients? That's a great question for a social epidemiologist, because there's a lot of answers that social epidemiologists have. And the, the, the I will say the answer that the social epidemiologist will give is not an answer. It's a question is what is the race of your patient and what is the race of your doctor? Um, and what is the gender, more importantly, of your doctor? Um, and so those things um, tend to lend to uh, listening to certain types of people more than others. Um, we know that there is a huge problem with maternal mortality rate in America, that is African-American women dying at a much higher rate than white women. Um, and the way you address that is by addressing the culture of medicine. Um, and, you know, if, if you're getting people, if people want to get a diagnosis, it really should be like a collaborative process with your doctor always. Like it should always be a collaborative process with your doctor. Your doctor is this portal to information that should be accessible to you as a patient. And that's part of their job is to make it accessible to you because that's part of informed consent which is part of, I think, you know, the doctoring oath, I forget the name of it, um, the Hippocratic oath. But yeah, an informed consent is part of the patient bill of rights or part of the patient bill of rights. Informed consent is part of some thing that came out of war crimes. So we care about it now, but we didn't at some point. And now we have to, because there are laws. Um, so, you know, Changing the culture of medicine is a great question. I know there's at least one doctor or medical student in the in the online virtual crowd right now. Um, but you know, I would say one of the one of the one tip that I got from a black TikTok was if your aunt is having trouble um, getting a diagnosis or getting help from their doctor, is to bring an advocate because a black person will always have someone on the phone when they're in the doctor's office. Um, is what this TikTok said. I don't know if that's true. Um, but the point is, you always have someone with you in the room when you're talking to the doctor, um, whether physically or on the phone virtually. Um, and that's just one way to address the ways in which the doctor may not actually listen to you, but they have to if there's someone else calling them out on it. Um, so you really do need a medical advocate um, if you're navigating the medical system that's not built for really anyone. So I think a medical advocate is really good for anyone. Um, even if you're an able-bodied white man, you still should have a medical advocate because the medical system is backwards in America. And it's going to be hard to navigate no matter who you are, even if you're a medical doctor, especially if you're a medical doctor, because then you're going to know people and you're going to have to go somewhere else and you have to navigate a whole other place now, right? And so like, yeah, so um, I'm going to answer. Were there any questions in the audience before I go back to the chat questions? Uh, okay. 
let's see. How can doctors best reexamine their roles in bettering public health? Um, that's great. Uh, I think doctors, how can doctors best reexamine their roles in bettering public health? I think doctors can reexamine their roles in bettering public health probably by recognizing their place in public health as public health practitioners of bringing individual level health to individual level people. Um, understanding, you know, basic, basic under, you know, like viewing a person as a whole person, community-based participatory research is a really, has really great tenants on, you know, how you work with people you're interested in helping. Um, there's someone in the crowd who's been to Afghanistan, and so I know she is very well versed in the tenets of community-based participatory research, um, where you want to work with people to help them with their with their best interests in mind. Um, and so, what does that even mean when you when you're not even from that country, right? So, like, how do you, how do you start with that? Um, and so, that's 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 sort of how to doc. Yeah. So that, that's my advice for doctors is to sort of. Look at, you know, use use some community-based participatory research it, skills in, you know, getting to know your patients better. Um, I think doctors are also sort of shot in the foot, too. So it's not just all their fault. It's a lot of the systems that we put them through where they have to check boxes and only certain things are covered in Medicare that they can do and, like, end-of-life um giving people end-of-life advice, like things like, do you have a living will? that's not covered under Medicare. And so, you know, like, because they're, they're, I don't know if you guys ever remembered like the, the death doctors or something that was, that was sort of what that was about was the end of life care uh, talks that doctors could give to people that were near their end of life or potentially nearing their end of life at any point in stage where it might be beneficial to have a living will. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, do you have any advice for youth considering a career in epidemiology, things like the level of education required and how to get experience? Um, yes. So there are now schools that have bachelors in public health. Um, I do not think you can get a very good job with a bachelors in public health because traditionally it has been masters in public health um, that you get to do public health work with as a professional. Um, the bachelor's in public health is a relatively new bachelor's for most places. The University of Maryland actually has a very old program for a bachelor's in public health, um, but it's a pre-professional degree or a pre-graduate degree, which means after your bachelor's in public health, you better be doing some other graduate degree work or another certificate or something to show them that you have the emotional maturity as well as like the analytical skills to do public health. I think um, one of the downsides of uh, having a bachelor's in public health is a lot of times, like I came to public health after having a career for 10 years in basic science um, because of all of the terrible things I saw in the world. And that took a lot of emotional development to you know, sort of come to this calling. And I am sort of bummed out by how sterile we have kept our society from understanding things about social determinants and structural oppression and critical race theory in our schools, um, that kids get to college and they hear these things and they don't fully, they hear them and they see them and they understand them, but maybe they don't fully integrate it into what it actually means right away because it actually takes years because you can't fully integrate it right away. It's one of those lessons that it's just, no matter what, it's gonna have to take time to marinate to actually be a good lesson. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, definitely you need graduate degree. Um, do you need a bachelor's of public health to get a master's of public health? No, you can get a bachelor's in anything. And as long as you have a good enough story for why that's applicable to what you wanna study in public health, that's great. And public health, you know, if you do a bachelor's in chemistry, go do environmental public health. If you do a bachelor's in psychology, go do health and behavior public health. Um, if you do a bachelor's in biology, you can do infectious disease. You could do social epidemiology because literally anyone can do social epidemiology. You could do a bachelor's in sociology and go do social epidemiology. Like it's, you know, like the 
it's it's really you know undergrad is sort of just do well and your graduate your pre your professional graduate degree is going to really what set you in the track of public health and what you want to do um let's see if covid levels are that high why are not emergency departments not full again higher level of immunity for non-vaccinated people due to everyday exposure or prior infections yeah probably then probably also um vaccinations um because uh vaccinations also lead to less emergency department visits um and definitely because higher level of immunity of non-vaccinated people and also the people who got covid the first time and died died um, so they're not going to catch it again and go to the hospital. Um, how do you differentiate between correlation and causation in a possibly more subjective branch of epidemiology like social epidemiology? Ah, okay. So that's great. So there's these things called causal pies in epi. That's like a little pie chart. And it's got all these different factors that lead up to a cause that you know, the the thing, it's like a, like a tipping point, right? There is no, usually there is no one cause, right? Like for suicide, um, there is no one thing oftentimes that will lead to suicide. It is a many factored, um, you know, the person has, is struggling with mental health issues, but they also lost their job and they also lost their housing and, you know, their cat just died or you, stuff like that. Um, like all of the cards just played it out right where it turned out <laughs> now is a really great time. My cat's dead. I don't even have to take care of him anymore. You know, like there's there's many factors that lead to an incident and in health outcome. And so while we are interested in causality, we aren't necessarily interested in the whole pie, but so much the tipping points. So what is the tipping point for getting people to eat healthy? Is it, you know, making groceries more affordable and more accessible? Is it teaching people how to cook? Or is it giving people the money that they need so they don't have to work? 80 hours a week so that I can actually have time to cook at home and eat healthy meals. Um, so maybe it's a factor of all three, right? So, you know, maybe to get to the root cause of a lot of these things, it takes many actions and many policies. Um, so maybe sometimes it's actually not necessarily getting to the root cause, but so much pointing to the idea that you can change something if you tweak it. It seems like epidemiology is losing the battle for spreading accurate information due to conspiracy theories, dissemination of deliberately false information. Are there any techniques that have some hope to, of overcoming this? Um, I mean, <laughs> that's that's a great question because science in general um, is losing the battle for spreading accurate information, right? And that's, that's the internet's fault, um, not really scientists' fault, I would say. Um, because the internet is really like, who's the loudest, gets the most retweets, gets, you know, whatever, is sometimes the most wrong and not the most right person on the internet. So um, are there techniques that have some hope of overcoming this? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of science communicators out there. There's a lot of epidemiology communicators out there. I think the People's CDC is a really good resource um, that does do disseminating of really accurate information. Um, I think the, the issue with, uh, you know, being able to delineate misinformation from information, um, is a long honed skill because it's like one of those time things, right? When it comes over time because the government can't be trusted, but also the government gives us our vaccines. But also the government like gave people syphilis and didn't treat them. But also like the government, you know, like the government has to be more consistent for people to actually trust it. Right. So like, I don't know if that's going to happen, but if scientists can be more consistent, that would be better. I think some scientists also struggle with being like with finding the right information that's out there. And I'm not talking about epidemiologists per se, but maybe maybe other scientists that are less aware of other types of systemic issues. Um, how do you make or start to make systemic changes in medicine? I feel like at least in medical dramas, they discuss how there's racial discrimination for organ transplants, um, mostly, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Okay, how do you make or start to make systemic changes in medicine? That's a great question. Um, systemic changes, 
so I just took a really awesome health policy class um, where we talked about the terrible, you know, medical industrial complex and how incredibly awful it treats uh, its employees um, and how we have the highest amount of money spent per capita, but we have one of the worst um, average lives lived in America um, of, out of all the developed nations in this world. Japan's the highest, we're the lowest um, by a lot, like several years, I wanna say maybe even 10. Um, it's like Japan's really good, um, but we're not doing very well. Um, and so systemic changes in medicine is gonna have to come from like big policy changes, but also like people from the ground up enforcing those policies, right? So the problem with medicine is it's it's a lot of old, old people that have just been there for a long time with their traditions. And to make systemic changes, you really need to question those traditions and you need to demand equity. And I think if you can unionize residents, that would be huge. I don't think residents are unionized. If you can unionize fellows, right? Like, like if you, like, there's money there's money in the in the medical industrial complex. It's going somewhere, but I'm pretty sure it's not going to medicines and fellow like residents and fellows. Um, and you know, like if you can if you can adjust how student loan burden in this country is also currently held on by medical students, that would also make a systemic change in medicine too, right? Like if it actually was more accessible and more affordable to students from lower economic, socioeconomic backgrounds, that would be huge. That would, that would make a huge change in medicine. Um, so yeah, that's this is some, some of my thoughts. Um, I was curious if you could think of any specific recommend, oh, did you have a question? Oh, I was curious if you could think of any specific recommendations for a good bachelor's for someone who wants to pursue a career in arthropod born ne uh, neglected tropical diseases. Oh yeah, I, biology, easy. Biology, molecular biology. You can do microbiology. I think that's what the undergrad degree is. That would be more like infectious diseases. Um, so microbiology, uh, you know, many different undergrads are gonna have many different kinds of programs. Um, I do know that the school um, in New Orleans Tulane has an infectious disease public health school and so they might have like actually really cool um, like research going on there, right? So you can get a you can get an undergrad degree in microbiology, but if you get an undergrad degree in microbiology and do a little bit of research, you'll be set. So um, you know, be sure to make sure you're looking. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So be sure to make sure uh, that you're looking at what kind of research is also there. What do you know about One Health? Oh, One Health is great. Um, it's sort of holistic. Uh, or it is holistic, not sort of. Um, it takes into account, I think, like like the whole it's like the whole person in the environment, and then like, you know, their interpersonal relationships and everything is one health. And um, I don't know, I don't know too much about it other than like what other people have told me. Um, how about mass stats and data analysis as paths into epidemiology? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know a lot of um, biostats people who are in my epi department. It's actually the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the University of Maryland. So the people that are getting their PhD in biostats in the epi department are dueling it, dueling it out <laughs> with the math department and the epi department. They like do it with both both departments actually. Yeah. Um, you mentioned. Uh, about how the science is losing, losing this information to the internet. Is there a branch of, of social epidemiology that might study, say, human murmurations uh, in, within the uh, within the realm of internet information? Oh yeah, you know? yeah. My my advisor does that actually. Yeah, yeah. So um, there's a great question, which was, um, are there epidemiologists that look at internet um, murmurs, murmuration, um, just movements uh, on social networks? Um, and the answer is yes. Um, using big data for health is huge. Uh, my advisor uses Twitter data to look at racial sentiments and birth outcomes in neighborhoods. 
So that's, you know, like, yes, yes, you can actually use. And they developed a chat bot to help um, talk to minority mothers that were expecting babies um, to help them have healthier pregnancies. So yes, there are epidemiologists actually doing stuff to go on, like, like, artificial intelligence spots to help minority mothers with pregnancies. Like that's amazing. Um, and that's on the internet. So like good things exist on the internet too. It's not just really loud, evil people. Um, Rosie, the chat bot, I think is what it's called is, is a really useful tool as well. Um, yeah. So those, yeah, that's, that's the, those, those are the questions I got. Awesome. Thank you guys. Yay. Oh, one question back there. What are your thoughts on harm reduction in the public health sphere? And and yeah and yeah harm reduction is great um it's you know i think the problem with harm reduction in america is our cop mentality and the ways in which we pathologize and criminalize people who have drug problems um so harm reduction doesn't do those things um, harm reduction is things like safe consumption sites or also known as safe injection sites where people can get clean needles. They can also use in those spaces where there are doctors present. So if they overdose, there's someone there to take care of them. Thank you. Um, and so, you know, there's, I think harm reduction is great. It's a great, great public health framework for helping people with um, substance use disorders. Yeah. And I think the issue with America is we don't like giving people, we don't like the idea of giving people needles to do drugs because we think people shouldn't do drugs, which is weird. So people are going to do drugs. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Um, the world is a sad place. Uh, cool. All right. Uh, do we have any other questions uh, from the participants online? Too far. I'm to follow that. Yeah. I, I don't really know much about social epidemiology, so this is interesting. And your point of like the point of epidemiology is to make change. Yeah. Right? yeah. Really interesting. In social epidemiology, that's much harder just because what you're doing seems so inherently more political. I mean, but I think of epidemiology and the CDC and the NIH. Yeah. They're not doing this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Is it, do you find it more frustrating? Um, you can collect all the data. Yeah, I mean, it, it is frustrating, um, but it also is heartening. Like I had a professor in my master's program who did a study during the gay marriage debate when gay marriage was up for legalization by the Supreme Court. Um, she wrote and did a study asking people, did they think gay marriage was going to ruin um, heterosexual marriage? They, they, did, they did that study and the overwhelming answer was no. And they published it and they used that in the Supreme Court case for approving gay marriage, which is really cool. So, you know, like things like, like, you know, if you put yourself out there enough times, you're going to make, you're going to make waves, little ones at first, but like, I think, you know, change can be happen, change, change can be taken. Um, could you please talk a little more about what you did during the Omicron wave, like what kind of data you collected and how it was collected, if you have time? Sure. Um, so I was just uh, epidemiologist one. So it was, it was real nice. I called healthcare professionals up on the phone and asked them about their COVID exposures. Um, we got lists of people who had taken COVID tests, who tested positive and who tested negative. Um, if they tested negative, I would call them and ask them about their exposures. Sometimes it'd be like a mistaken negative. Like they're like, oh no, I was actually positive because I took another one the next day and I was positive. And so I'm like, oh, okay, well, um, I would go through a questionnaire with them and ask them like what they'd done in the last two weeks, you know, basic demographics, um, sex, gender, et cetera. Uh, and if they had been sick, I'd ask them about their, you know, symptoms. Um, if they'd been, you know, since all healthcare professionals had to be vaccinated, they were the population of interest to use for vaccine effectiveness. So that was the project I was on. Um, Asking if they are negative, what information were you gathering from that protective agents like previous infections? Ah, so we were asking um, basically, you know, how severe their disease was, like, were they hospitalized, like how long they were sick for? 
Um, and if they were, and if they were negative, sometimes they get tested, you know, because they're sick, but they're negative for COVID. So you have to find out what other disease they might have instead that they got exposed to. So all of this data ended up going into the vaccine effectiveness publications that the CDC made in the last like 2022, 2023. Yeah. Yay. Thank you. Thanks everyone. This has been great. Yay. Thank you everyone online for joining us. Mm -hmm.